Well, before we dive into today's Bible reading, we're going to talk uh, specifically today about what you see on the screen, that good comes out of something bad. Where something was meant to be bad, something was meant to go wrong, but something good can still come from it. That's our Bible story for today, the story of Joseph that we're going to talk about. But before we get there, I want to talk a little more about how we see this in the world around us. Something was meant to be bad, but something good ends up coming from it. Now we have sometimes these nice uh, phrases or these nice sayings, or sometimes they're a little bit cliche. We say some of these lines when we're talking about this kind of a situation. And so I researched this week and I found this list of, of the top five cliches, of the top five phrases uh, that we use sometimes to explain why uh, in the midst of something bad how something good can happen now i've always wanted to be a game show host steve i've always wanted to be so i thought well hey we'll play fam family feud today so i went to one web i surveyed one website and uh, the top five answers are on the board i'll call up no i'm not actually going to call anybody up here you guys we'll go through it together again these are the top some of these phrases that we use to try to comfort someone or to try to explain to someone if you're in the midst of something bad something good can still come let's do this together here in no order there's blank at the end of the tunnel you help me fill it in there's blank at the end of the tunnel light at the end good at the end of the tunnel no pain no love it it's always blank before the dawn good job it's just a blank in disguise it's just a blessing in disguise in every cloud, there is a silver lining. Thank you for playing. I even wrote that here. Thank you for playing. <laughs> These five phrases are five of many, but what are we using them for? We're talking to people who may be in the midst of a bad situation, who may be in the midst of, of, of the cloud or in the pain, and we're saying, hey, there's a better hope. But I want to make sure we understand what we're saying when we say these and when it really makes sense to use some of these. Because sometimes when we're in the pit, the last thing you want to hear is, hey, no pain, no gain. Maybe not be the right time. Here's the other way I thought of it this week. You ever said this? Joke's on you. <laughs> you meant for something to be bad, but something good came from it. Here's the one I thought of. I know most of you think of me just as a perfect, angelic uh, young man, right? <laughs> some of you laugh more than others. Some of you know me more than others. Um, <laughs> As when I was a kid, 90% of the time, really, I was a pretty good kid, but every once in a while, I'd do something that my parents didn't like. And, and I'm not going to share a specific situation, um, but I'll tell you the general what happened a couple times. I would do something, and I would upset my mom, and I'd upset my dad, and they'd say, go to your room. You know where I'm going with this, maybe? Go to your room. I say, absolutely, that's where my... That's where my video games are, that's where my computer is, that's where my Legos are, my computer, my, yeah. I could have looked at, if I was not a very smart kid, I could have looked at them and said, joke's on you. I never did. I never did. They're not watching. It's okay. Uh, you wanted a punishment. You wanted a punishment to put me in my room. You wanted something bad. But actually, joke's on you. Something good came from it. Now, this is a silly, light, little talk about this idea, but we're going to look at a biblical story of how God brought good from something bad. I'm going to invite Sydney up again, and she's going to read the story of Joseph and his brothers. Now, this story happens over 13 chapters of Genesis. So, Sydney, if you'll take a seat and read, we'll listen. We've got to... No, she's going to read just the end of it, and then I'm going to come back and tell you how we got there. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. I'll invite Sydney to come up and read that for us. I'll turn it on for you. All right, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along as I read. Starting with verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came down and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, 
Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intend to harm me, but God intended it for good. He used it to accomplish what is now being done, which is the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. So how did we get there? That's what we're going to... She just read the end of those 13 chapters, the end of the story. But we're going to ask, how did we get there? Before we go there, I really quick want to say, again, welcome to those online. When I said that earlier, you didn't hear me. But And then also, uh, we live stream, as many of you know, we live stream over to Wesley Church over in East Dubuque. Welcome to you as well. Uh, we're sorry we stole Sydney, but we're really not that sorry. So uh, <laughs> we hope you're having good worship as well. This is the end of the story, right? This is the silver lining, the blessing in disguise. But let's go back and look at how we got here. As I heard from someone this last week, like I told you, we may know the parts of the story, but we may not have read it since Sunday school, and do we know what it's trying to teach us? So I want to take time to go back and tell you how we got here. We're going to look at the story of Joseph two or three times today and look at, at the different parts of it and what it has to tell us. So let's start with... Uh, his family tree, and I know it's a lot of small type, but let me just quickly go through it here. We last week talked, if you look in the top, middle, middle towards the top under Terah, Abraham is who we talked about last week. Abraham married Sarah. They had the miraculous birth of their son, Isaac. That's what we talked about last Sunday, was the story of Abraham and Isaac, uh, also found in Genesis, if you missed it and you want to go back. Isaac married Rebekah, and they had two kids. They had Is Jacob, also known as Israel, and they also had Esau. Now, Jacob ended up having 12 sons and one daughter and four wives. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but <laughs> I want you to know that Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter. Out of the 12 sons, it says that Joseph, you see his, his name's highlighted over there, Joseph was the favorite of Jacob's sons. He was the favorite because he, he was born later in Jacob's life so Jacob the, the dad Jacob made his son Joseph a long multicolored robe perhaps you've heard of it called a technicolor dream coat well when you, you become a, a favorite like Joseph uh, his brothers the other 11 started to not like Joseph because he was the favorite couple that with then later Joseph started to say hey I've got these dreams I've got these visions and in them I am at the top, and you are all worshiping me. Well, that didn't help him with his brothers, right? <laughs> they, they first, then they decided they wanted to kill Joseph. And one brother's like, hey, I don't know that we want to go that far. Reuben, Reuben had some common sense, right? And he said, hey, let's just, let's just throw him in a pit. So they took Joseph, and they threw him in a pit. They first took the coat from him, and then they threw him in the pit. That was some of the first harm that was done, some of the bad that happened to Joseph. Now, they threw him in the pit, but not long after, all of a sudden, these people called the Ishmaelites, were, they were traveling by, they were heading to Egypt, and the brothers said, hey, I know one thing we can do worse than throw him in a pit. Let's sell him to those people and sell him into slavery. So he got sent with the Ishmaelites off to Egypt. They went then home to the dad, they, Joseph's dad, Jacob, and they said, Jacob, here's the coat. Joseph's dead. Fast forward a little bit. Joseph then, like I said, he was sold and brought into Egypt by the Ishmaelites, and he ended up being housed with a person named Potiphar, who was the chief priest, or chief officer, excuse me, of the Pharaoh. It says in, in Genesis that God was with Joseph, even in that time. And because of that, Joseph started to do great things for Potiphar, so he got raised, and he was like the leader of Potiphar's house. Until all of a sudden, I don't want to go into details on this either, you can look it up in Genesis, uh, Potiphar's wife accused uh, Joseph of some bad things, and Joseph ended up being thrown into prison. Another, for lack of a better word, another bad day for Joseph. <laughs> While in prison, Joseph begins, uh, he, first they say, Joseph, you're in prison, but you're also going to be in charge of the prison. And then he starts interpreting dreams, and they hear about it. So they say, Joseph, come with us. The Pharaoh wants you to interpret his dreams. It's a big deal, right? Right at the top. 
And so one of the dreams he interprets for the Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, there are going to be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. The Pharaoh uh, eventually believed and, and, and saw the work that God was doing through Joseph, and so he made Joseph the lead of all of the Pharaoh's land. Stick with me. You're doing good. You guys are with me. We're good? So they had seven years of abundance, and then they started to have those seven years of famine, just as Joseph had said would happen. Well, the famine spread even back to where Joseph was from, where his brothers still were. So the brothers decided, hey, remember, they don't know where Joseph is. They decided, hey, we're going to go to Egypt, and we need to get some grain to help us in this famine. And they did, but they didn't recognize Joseph. So Joseph put him through some tests. He put some in prison. He sent some of them back for a specific purpose. He even accused some of them of stealing. But eventually, Joseph reveals himself. He has that ultimate reveal. It shows his brother who he, who they, he is. And he says right there, don't feel bad for what you did because God ended up bringing good from it. The story ends with the brothers going back and they bring their, their dad to Egypt and they live there until the dad dies. And that's where Sydney started reading today where it says, knowing the dad died, they were worried, hey, we may be back in trouble with Joseph because we did some bad things to him. And that's where this scripture comes. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That's the story of Joseph. I want to look at it one other way here. I've got my whiteboard here. All right. So Joseph was having a pretty good life, right? Having a pretty good life. He was born. He's, he's got brothers that didn't like him. But hey, he's the top. He's his dad's favorite. But all of a sudden, the brothers take him, right? They take him and they throw him in a pit. Bad day. Goes down a little bit. They say, brothers go, no, actually, we're going to go worse. We're going to sell you into slavery. You're going to end up in the land of Egypt. So his day goes worse. But when he's there, he ends up being raised up, and he becomes one of the leaders for Potiphar, and he's having good times. Things are good. Things are good. But then Potiphar's wife says, hey, you did bad things. So he has another bad day. And then... He gets asked to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, right? So he starts to have a better day. And then, uh, yeah, there may have been a day where there wasn't anything. And then, he, then all of a sudden, hey, you're going to be over the land. Oh, wow, that's a big deal. And then he's reunited with his brothers. And then he's the ruler. That's the story of Joseph. Another way to say that, it's a story of hills and valleys. So we're going to look at this and we're going to say, what does this have to do with any of us? What does this have to do with people who seem to live pretty good lives in the Midwest? It, it's simply this. I believe that this scripture was true back then, and it's true for us today. That even when evil happens, even when bad things happen, God can use it for good. That's what we're going to talk about in our time remaining. These three things. Bad things happen, but God is present. So because God's present, good things can come. Bad things happen, but God is present, so good things can come. Let's start with this. Bad things happen. Look at the story of Joseph. He's the favorite son. Life is good. He's on one of the hills, but all of a sudden, he's got some bad times that happen, right? He's sold into slavery. He's thrown into a pit, and then things get a little better, but then even after that, bad times happen again. He ends up in prison. We know bad things happen to Joseph, and we know for the truth, for many of us, bad things happen to you and I as well because we've lived it. We've seen it. Bad things happen. Now, I'm not talking little bad things like that Starbucks got rid of straws, right? That's not a real bad, bad thing. Or that somebody took your seat today in worship is not probably that bad. Or, or that you went to the grocery store and you get home and you went, oh, I knew I forgot something. Those are inconveniences. But I look out and I know some of you, and I know you know that bad things happen. Bad things can happen. What, a, what an uplifting message, huh? <laughs> what a nice uplifting message. Bad things can happen in your life. The question is, there is too much stuff up here. I'm just going to do that. Um, the question is, what do you do next? What do you do at these points? What do you do when the bad things happen? We saw in the story of Joseph also sometimes... 
Sometimes these bad things aren't even something you caused, right? Joseph's brothers made this happen to him, and Potiphar's wife made it happen to him. Sometimes the bad things happen to you. You're not even the one that caused them, but they happen. The question is, what do you do next? Now, sometimes we do cause them. Sometimes we sin and we make mistakes and we cause the valleys, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes cancers happen. Loved ones die. Jobs are lost. Depression and anxiety can take over lives. Addictions can cause loss of relationships. Marriages can get strained or end. Kids or grandkids can get in trouble and live harder lives than you expected. Bad times happen. Valleys happen. Whether you caused it or not, whether someone caused it to happen to you, or whether you have no idea why that happened, bad times happen. But we don't end there. Because God is present. As I read through that story of Joseph this week, as I was reading it, I, it caught my attention that multiple times the words, the Lord was with Joseph, is found throughout Genesis. It says, after Joseph was sold to the people from Egypt, the Lord was with Joseph. And after he was thrown into jail, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. And after they needed somebody to take control of Pharaoh's land, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. Even in the midst of the bad, God is present. Here's how I'll do this. I'm trying my best to write well, but that's not my gift. God, that says present. God is present. <laughs> Maybe next one you write it, Sydney. I don't know. I'm just... In the midst of the bad, God is present. It's not magic. It's not that everything will automatically be perfect in an instant. It's the knowledge that you don't have to go through it alone. It was true for Joseph, and I believe it's true for you and I as well, that even when bad things happen, you can believe and know that God is with us. Why? Because he promised he would be. So you go, you go to a doctor's appointment, you get the diagnosis you didn't want. It's okay to be angry and scared and worried. But I hope you also remember this, that in the midst of the valleys, God is still present. As loved one dies, as jobs are lost, as we suffer depression, as we're stuck in the midst of bad relationships or addictions, God is still present. The psalmist David wrote about this. He wrote uh, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me even when I'm glimpsing death, even when I'm in the darkest valley, David writes, I know I have hope. I know I have a promise of these better, these upturns, these, these hills, because you're with me. And because God's present, good things can come. Joseph was in a bad place when he was sent into Egypt, and again, when he was thrown into prison, bad things happen, but good things come from it. It's that scripture again. You planned for evil, but God meant for... We'll do it one more time. God meant, you meant for evil, but God meant for... Good. Yeah, I like that. The same possibility is there for you and me. The issue is we don't always know what God's good looks like. The issue is I, my idea of good when I pray may be one thing, but God says it might be something different. Here's how Isaiah says it. As the heavens are higher than the earth... God says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's way of working doesn't always make sense to us because his thoughts and his ways and his actions are bigger than anything that I or you can understand. So I get a cancer diagnosis or relationships are strained or I can't beat an addiction. It's easy to stay. It's easy to stay at the point that bad things happen, right? Easy to stay there. It's easy to stay even sometimes to say, All right, bad things happen, God's present, but it's not going to get any better. I struggle with this sometimes at point three. Good things can come. And why do I struggle with this? Because his ways aren't my ways. They're higher than mine. They're, he, he's a lot smarter than me. His ways are better than my ways, and his thoughts are better than my thoughts. But something good can come from it. Romans 828 we saw in that opening video says we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose 
Even when we don't get it, even when we don't see the rest of the story, he's still working to bring about the hill. That's the message I want everybody to hear today, that our God is still working and is still working things for good. And even if it's not the good that you wanted, it may be the good that, that, that he wants for us. Even if it's not what we expected, God's still working. God still works for the people that, uh, thank you, Ty, but I, I, I still got a little bit to go. Uh, thank you. He was going to play me off. I appreciate it, but... Uh, Where's Stacy? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, God's still working the good things for those who say, I will follow Jesus. Now, I can stand up here today and tell you stories of miracles that happen, right? That something bad, excuse me, something bad happens, God's present, and then a miraculous healing or a miraculous uh, uh, relationship is saved. I can tell you those stories, and they're out there. But I think it's also important to know that sometimes it looks like it didn't happen. That a loved one still dies. Cancer still happens. What do we say about that? Relationships aren't brought back together sometimes. Sometimes people do die. Sometimes unemployment lasts for far too long. And sometimes parents and kids don't reconcile. It may look like God isn't working things for the good. But maybe it's not the good that we're looking for, right? Maybe it's that God's not done working yet. You know when I'll hear that? I'll hear, the thing is, with all those, you know, those phrases we shared and, and the word that, hey, good's still coming, I don't always want to hear that when I'm at the pit. You guys? Sometimes I'm at the pit, I just want to be in the pit. But after I get out of it a little bit, I can look back and say, yeah, good things did come. Let me tell you this story. This is a story of this in my life. Uh, as I was writing this, I was reminded of a story of my friend Mike Jensen, and I don't know how much of his story I've shared here before. Mike's the one up front with the guitar. The good-looking guy with the dark rim glasses and hair was me. Um, <laughs> uh, Mike uh, it has a story of this, hills and valleys. Mike uh, was a professor at Wartburg and was a worship leader at Nazareth Lutheran Church in Cedar Falls and was my mentor and helped me uh, learn how to do some of the stuff that, that I get to do. Well, in 2013, Mike was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor, and he had ups and downs. He had, he had hills and he had valleys. Uh, but eventually, uh, he needed to go into a care facility because he was losing uh, a lot of his memory and a lot of his, his thought patterns and things like that were gone. And... Uh, Every once in a while, he'd have some ups, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't go this easy usually, right? There's little ups and little downs, little ups, little downs. Until about three years ago, Mike, uh, Mike ran away. He didn't know. He'd lost most of his memory and things like that. So Mike ran away from his care facility and was lost out in the midst of who knows where. And so my friends and I and, and, and thousands, hundreds of others, at least, traveled to Waverly Cedar Falls to do a search for Mike. It was about three years ago, and I remember at that same time, Grandview was spending time uh, studying and praying Psalm 23. Remember, we talked about that just a minute ago. So I remember searching through literal hills and valleys for Mike, and the whole time saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you are with me, and praying that for Mike. Mike was found, by the way. Mike was found, and, and he uh, was okay. By all miracles, he had been outside for four days and uh, didn't know where he was. And somehow, uh, well, I know how, God provided, right? And, and he, made it, he made it home. Now, I'd love to say that that's where the story ends and Mike's doing well. And he's, Mike passed away about eight months ago uh, because he just kept having harder days and, and harder days. Um, there's my buddy. And uh, it's a story of hills and valleys. Let me tell you this. When Mike was lost, I didn't want anybody to say, hey, no pain, no gain, Alec. What? I didn't even want to hear that good things can come. When Mike died eight months ago, I didn't want to hear bad things happen, but God can use it for the good. But now I'm removed from it, right? Now I'm able to look at it and say, yeah, good things did come. His family reconnected in a way that is, is amazing. They had been a little bit estranged, and they're all connected again together. They're going on a trip, they just told me not long, 
my friends and I connected. We did a, a recording project uh, from across the state and recorded uh, old worship songs that Mike had taught us so that we could share with those and one another. That was a good thing that came from it. And here's the biggest good that I saw. Sometimes the good thing that we want, the, the gift, the ultimate thing we want is just number two. And through it all, I noticed God was present. God was present during his, his celebration of life. And God was present with, with Mike's wife as she went and spread Mike's ashes. And, and God was present through it all. Here's the truth. I didn't see it at the time, but God did bring good. Is that easy to look at right in the midst of the valley? No. But right now I can see it, and I hope you can see it sometimes too. I, to end, and I, oh, I'm doing okay on time, good. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> I want to share two more things. Sometimes finding God's present in, presence in the midst of the bad is the good. Sometimes finding God's presence in the midst of the bad is the good. I'm reading this book, which is a big deal for me to read a book uh, after seminary. I just kind of was done. Uh, I'm reading this book with our high, some of our high school students are doing a uh, in-depth uh, Bible study at coffee houses around Dubuque, which I'm so proud of them for doing. And we're reading this book called 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask and Answer About Christianity. I'm telling you, it, there is some tough stuff in here, including the author writes about uh, why do uh, bad things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? And she tells it like this. She said, think of this. Because she's saying what I'm saying. Sometimes finding God in the midst of it is the good. She says, think of this. Think of a spoiled kid. None of them here at Grandview, I'm sure. But sometimes truly spoiled kids live for more stuff. They want whatever gift you will give them, but they don't always want to spend time with the giver. Here's the quote she says. Sometimes if we're honest... We want the gift more than we want the giver. What we need the most is not what Jesus can give us. It's Jesus himself. God is not a means to an end. God is the end. So as we close, there we go. <laughs> if you're in the midst of a valley, if you're in the midst of a battle, if you're in the midst of bad things happening all around you, I want to tell you your story isn't over yet. God is still working. What happens may not be what you expect or, or what you imagined, but it can be what you need most. It may not be what Jesus gives you. It may be that you get connected with Jesus himself. So if you're looking at a battle in your life, if you're looking at things going bad all around you, if you're looking at problems every day and you don't know what to do, you need to know that bad things happen, yes, but God is always there and God's working something good for them. So what do we do in it? What do we do in the midst what do we do in the midst of the valley? We can stop. We can stay there, right? But I'm saying I think God's calling us to hang in. God's calling us to hang in. Don't give up. It's easier to pull away from God, but instead it's time for us to lean in. Spend time in your Bible. It doesn't make sense. You can be angry with God even in the midst of it, but spend time in your Bible. Spend time with God's people. Challenge yourself to understand God more that so when bad things happen, you can believe and live like God is with you. Perhaps that's all we need is that reminder that God is with us. The last thing, I promise it is actually the last thing. You may not be the person that needs this today. I know that. I know that many times if we're willing to come into a church, we feel like things are going okay. But there may be people who you know that need this. So share it. Tell them. Tell them this same story. You don't have to be as weird as me, but tell them the same story with some excitement and saying, our God is still present even in the midst of your hurting. And if they're in the midst of the hurting and they're not ready to hear that, just be with them. Invite them to be part of God's community. Invite them to have a Bible. We've got more Bibles than we know what to do with. Is that fair, Melissa? And if we run out, guess what? We'll buy more. So if you want a Bible to give to somebody so that they can get connected in the midst of their valley, we'll give you a box of them. Why? Because staying connected with God is what's important. We want the gift sometimes more than we want the giver. That smacked me in the head this week, folks. We want the gift sometimes more than we want the giver. But instead, what we need most right now is not what Jesus can give us, but it's Jesus himself. Let's pray.
Lord God, I thank you so much for your word that challenges, that pushes us, that confronts us in sometimes where we feel idle. Lord, I thank you that we have this time to be together, and I thank you for the example that we're able to be in this community. Now you help us to do it. Help us to share that better times are coming. And even if you're stuck in the bad times, let us help people know that there's people that are willing to be there with them. Lord God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who paid the ultimate price, who, who helped us be able to have a hope for a better tomorrow. And Lord God, as your church gathered, we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.